Hello AP Psych class. In this video we're going to talk about uh, the encoding process, which refers to getting information into our memory system, especially our long-term memory system. This is a very important process demonstrated and described in the atkinson schifrin model. By the end of this video you should be able to identify what information we encode automatically and what type of information do we encode effortfully and how does, how does distributed practice influence our retention of information? Remember, be kind and rewind. Uh, have your notes open and uh, your textbook open. And let's get started. So we're going to talk about automatic processing first, or um, processing in this case also refers to encoding and retrieval. And due to parallel processing, you can automatically encode a lot of information into your long-term memory without even trying. What parallel processing refers to is the idea that your brain is able to process information uh, at different levels in different places simultaneously. So while you might be thinking about your upcoming math test, another part of your brain below conscious awareness can also be processing information about your environment and other aspects of your experiences. Examples of automatically encoded information includes things like the environment you're in when a memory formed, uh, the time of day that an incident took place, how often you've done something today, and in what order you did things. For example, you might be able to identify without um, consciously having tried to what route you took to school today uh, and how you got home. You might also be able to identify some of the people you sat next to during lunch or what was served for lunch today. Um, also, you might be able to identify when was the last time you studied with your classmates and where you studied. And also events uh, like a sporting event, what was going on and how you felt and who you were with. So a lot of that information gets in without you trying to get in to your memory system. How this works, if you remember our little model of the atkinson schifrin memory model, that information usually goes from sensory memory, if you pay attention to it, into short-term memory for processing by your working memory in your central executive system. And if made meaningful, you can get it into long-term memory. But sometimes information goes directly from sensory memory over to long-term memory, and the working memory doesn't even process information. Um, to continue, um, other things like well-learned information that you know really, really well, um, maybe something that you're very interested in, a topic, whether it's science or literature, um, you can um, retrieve that information with very little effort. Also, using words in your native language and reading, um, this is automatically processed, and it's actually difficult to turn off. So if I asked you to, un to not understand the next word, um, that I say, try not to understand the upcoming word. Flamingo. If you were able to understand that this is a large uh, pink bird with a long neck, even though I told you not to, it's an example of automatic processing. So uh, a lot of things that we do don't require effortful processing of information. So what is well learned can be automatically processed. Um, if you can't read this sentence that I um, just put up, try going from right to left instead. Effortful processing can become automatic. So what, what took effortful processing at first um, after um, it's well learned can certainly become automatic. So if we take a look at effortful processing now, this is a type of encoding and memory processing that requires attention and effort. I'm going to share some of the examples of effortful processing with you. One of the simplest forms is rehearsal. And this is just conscious repetition. And that can, it can produce more durable memories, but it's really the shallowest form of encoding. So if you're repeating somebody's name, so you remember it in a few minutes, or you're repeating somebody's phone number, or you're repeating uh, a short statement, it can keep it in the, the short-term working memory for a while, but it's, it's really not useful to remember things for the long term. 
Ebbinghaus, kind of the grandfather of memory in the late 1800s, used something called CVCs to study the effectiveness of rehearsal. And CVC stands for consonants, vowels, and consonants. So he created a whole uh, list of hundreds of words that were nonsense words created with a consonant, vowel, and consonant that have no meaning because he didn't want to be able to attach meaningfulness to these terms. He just wanted to try to effortfully process them. And he created lists of 10 or 20 of these CVCs and rehearsed them until he remembered them, uh, the list 100% accurate, and then put them away. He tried to recall those lists later, an hour later, a day later, a week later, and he discovered this, the amount remembered depends on the time spent learning. So in this chart, the longer he spent learning the list of CVCs on the first day, the less number of repetitions it took him to learn it a second day. So if I studied it 20 minutes, it only took me 16 repetitions to relearn it. The less time he spent, the more repetitions it took him to learn it. Another way that we can use effortful processing is overlearning, which means even after we think we know the material and we can kind of repeat it in our heads as we look at our notes, additional rehearsal increases our ability to maintain that information especially for new information that we're learning. Mass practice, this is how most people study. Uh, if we have a test in two weeks, um, people typically don't study on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Thursday night, a mass practice. They um, study all their material as often as they can, and it produces short-term retention it makes you feel confident, but um, it's not good for knowing things in a week or two. It might help you the, the next day on the test, but it doesn't help you learn the information over time. Spacing effect is much better. Spacing effect means you distribute your practice time, and it produces longer-term retention of the material. Um, Start studying on the first day of a unit, what we learned, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, and continue to do that as we go through the unit, then you're spacing out your studying, uh, and it, it tends to uh, remain with you much longer over a period of time. So knowing everything when you cram the night before a test means you're gonna not know any of that stuff or very little of that a month later. So Harry Barrick, um, used the spacing effect to study foreign language translation. He used his family members, his children, and his wife, and they studied a given number of foreign language terms um, over in different intervals, uh, restudying 14 days later up to 56 days later, and they found that the longer the space between practice sessions, uh, the better the retention was up to five years later. So over here, how to study for an exam in one day cramming. There's not a lot of evidence to show that this information is well remembered later on. The testing effect in effortful processing, I'm not sure if this is in your textbook, but the testing effect suggests that if you have quizzes, more frequent quizzes, or repeated testing of previously learned information, learn, leads to greater retention of that material, even better than just rehearsing it again over time. And this includes self-testing as well. So after you read a section of your AP psych text, you, you put it away and ask yourself three or four questions or answer the questions that are in the textbook. Our author does a great job of asking some questions after a section and before a section. Um, that should help you learn material. So if you test and quiz yourself, you ask yourself mental questions, you're gonna learn the material better. Some other memory phenomenon, um, all relate to what tends to, to be better recalled later. Um, the serial position effect, when we're trying to remember a list of terms or uh, a list of names or people's names, we tend to remember, let's say 10 people introduce themselves, the first person and the last person in a list tend to be the best remembered. Now, this relates to the primacy effect or the first term or name in a list while it's the most rehearsed, tends to be the best remembered. 
So the first term in a list is remembered better than the last because it's rehearsed the longest. And that's if we're asked to remember something later. If we're asked to remember something immediately, uh, the recency effect tends to take place. We tend to remember the word that's still in our long-term memory, but as this fades, the primacy effect tends to rule. Now, what effortful processing works the best? In an interesting study, Craig and Tulving flashed um, words on a screen to people and then followed up that word. So a word would be flashed on a screen and then they would be asked a question about that word. What type of question led to better retention and better recall later on? Well, uh, the study was interesting because one of the terms they might flash up was the word chair. And then they asked a visually processed question. So a chair disappeared from the screen and the researcher asked, Is the, was the word in capital letters? And in this place, or in this case, the person would ask, answer yes. Um, acoustically, if a word flashed on the screen was brain, when that word disappeared, they were asked, did that word rhyme with the, with the word train? And the person would say, oh, yes, it did. Or they asked them to process something meaningfully. We call that semantically encoded. It's a deep process of meaning. It requires the working memory um, and your central executive. If a word flashed on the screen was gun, and when that word disappeared, they asked, does the word fit into this sentence? The girl put the blank on the table. Again, the answer would be yes, but the person has to process that word, not only what it looked like and sounded like, but also what did it mean? Did it fit in syntactically with um, this sentence? Now, what they did find was that the deeper processing question, the semantically processed third question, triggered much better memory than did the shallower processing first two questions. By processing information deeply from its meaning, it produces better retention. Now, how could this help you study? When you learn a new term or a new concept, can you mentally relate it to other concepts that you know? Can you explain it to somebody else? Can you process it uh, in a different way? And this tends to lead to much better retention. So if we look here, um, people who were the terms that were semantically encoded or they were asked a question like, did the, did the girl place the gun on the table? They remembered those terms 90% of the time with the acoustic, almost 60% of, of the time and visually only about 15% of the time. So you could help yourself study better by stopping occasionally and um, asking yourself some questions and elaborating on information. So rephrasing information into meaningful terms requires working memory. This enhances retention semantically. Um, Self-reference effect, can you make the information personally meaningful to yourself? How does it relate to your life or the people around you? Helps you process semantically and more deeply. And using imagery also enhances retention. We, we more easily remember words that lend themselves to imagery like the word computer than abstract terms like the word process. So anytime you can relate concepts or terms to concrete um, imagery, the more you likely encode that information. So that's just about it. We have one more process to cover, so hang in there. Uh, remember an important point, the amount remembered depends on the time spent learning and on the effort to make the information meaningful. Notice I didn't just say it, I said the word information to help you encode. Ebbinghaus, remember the grandfather of memory, states that learning meaningful information requires about one-tenth the effort. So you might guess that two types of encoding also are better than one. So if you can visually encode something with imagery and semantically encode something with meaning, you're going to remember that information better. Other memory enhancers include the chunking process, studying in hierarchies and mnemonic devices. So this phone number here uh, might be difficult to remember, but if we divide it in two chunks, we can remember it easily. And chunking is just grouping things uh, into a meaningful way or organizing things meaningfully. So the very famous phrase, four score and seven years ago, should be much better remembered 
than the number the letters uh, randomly. Or even seven to go four in your score, the syntax of that is is not very useful to us to remember. So four score and seven years ago, when we chunk meaningfully, is much easier to remember. Another chunking example is how long do you think it would take you to remember the sequence of letters? Probably a while. What if we chunk them like this? And you might recognize a pattern that it would be much easier, quickly, uh, easy to remember when chunk DVD, FBI, USA, and CIA. And hierarchies, we, we, we tend to develop and organize information in hierarchies once we've learned something very well. Um, experts tend to organize in their memory based on broad topics first, general topics divided and subdivided into smaller, more narrow and more precise topics, concepts, and facts. Gordon Bauer presented words either randomly or grouped into related categories, and you can guess that people remembered the related categories much more easily. So the benefit of organizing information, not just studying everything at the same time and just reading through your notes over and over and over. Um, basically, your notes prime the next notes that come. Uh, you want to divide the information up and study chunks of information and hierarchies. For example, if we're studying memory, we might study the information processing model by Atkinson, Schifrin, and study each of these topics, these general topics, separately and more, uh, and then get more specific. It would help us. So that's it for now. Remember, be kind and rewind. Uh, if you are supposed to take Cornell notes, do so. And remember to make those notes meaningful, semantic encoding.